My Lords, since World War II, there have been huge social changes in our country, not least as they impact on the presence and role of religion in society. In the census of 2011, there was a voluntary question about religion. This revealed the presence of 33.2 million Christians, 59% of the country, but this was down from the 72% of 2001. At the same time, the Muslim presence was revealed as 2.7 million, 4.8% of the population, up from the 3% in 2001. Other religions also showed an increase. Hindus up to 1.5% of the population, Sikhs to 0.8% of the population, the same figure as a combination of other, all other religions except for Judaism, which remained static on 0.5%. <coughs> No less significant was the number of people who said that they had no religion. This was 14.1 million, 25.1% of the population, which was up from the 14.8% in 2001, making it the second largest category after Christianity. And to this might be added the large number of people who now prefer to define themselves as spiritual rather than religious. In addition to this, it's important to note post-World War II immigration, which has brought people from the Caribbean and later from West Africa, resulting in thousands of lively black-led churches and a major black presence, for example, in the Anglican Diocese of London. Between 2005 and 2012, there were 700 new Pentecostal churches started, of which 400 were black majority led. In a similar way, immigration from Eastern Europe has significantly boosted Roman Catholic and Orthodox congregations. So the religious landscape is variegated and in many respects very lively. It's certainly very different from what it was in 1945. If we had to contrast two Britain TV series in which the clergy start to indicate this difference, it would be the Reverend Sidney Chambers, Vicar of Grantchester in the 1950s, with the Reverend Adam Smallwood as, as Rev in an Indy City London parish. However, my lords, it's not just the presence of non-Christian religions and those who profess no religion that's made the difference. It is that religion is visible and agitative in a way that it was not before. It has a voice, or rather a variety of voices, that want to be heard in the public sphere. They're not content to have religion confined to the inward and personal dimension. So it is, for example, that issues concerning the wearing of a cross and employment practices have found their way to the European Court of Human Rights. And as we know, there have been major issues concerning religion in schools. In short, whether one likes it or not, religion is now a major player on the public stage in a way that could not have been envisaged perhaps even 30 years ago. There are, of course, a number of other reasons for this in addition to the varied religious landscape. One is globalization which has taken people from societies in which they may have had a settled social identity to another where they have been a minority and they've developed a religious identity. This has had the effect of making religion a badge of identity at a time when the politics of identity has come very much to the fore. So for all these reasons, it's therefore an area that governments have to think about seriously, coherently and consistently across a whole range of policy areas. It is also the reason that the Wolf Institute in Cambridge convened the Commission on Religion and Belief in British Public Life, chaired by the noble lady Baroness uh, Butler Sloss, of which I'm a member. The Commission has existed for a year, is now in the process of consulting widely, and is intending to present a report to the new government next year. In our consultation booklet, we set out five major areas where we're looking for views the law, education, dialogue and engagement, the media and social action. I'm therefore delighted to have been able to obtain this debate and I very much look forward to hearing what your Lordships will be saying under any of those headings or any other. A number of your Lordships who wish to speak in the debate today were sadly engaged elsewhere, but I would like to quote one of them, the former Chief Rabbi, Lord Sachs, who wrote to me to send his apologies and who wrote, Please, though, accept my deep commitment to the vital role of religion and belief in public life. It remains the most powerful shaper of civil society, a much-needed source of altruism in a culture which seems otherwise to celebrate the self, and an unrivaled heritage of wisdom on the great questions of ethics and society that we'll never cease asking as we strive to be true to our faith and a blessing to others regardless of their faith. 
And that said, I should stress, my Lord, that the phrase religion and belief, the phrase which is now the correct designation for policy in this area, has belief in it as well as religion, and that includes those who take a robustly secular view of life. I wish to begin by simply setting out some basic principles on, the, on which I believe any government should approach the formation of public policy in this area. First uh, and formal, firm, foremost, there should be equal respect and concern for all people, whatever their faith or belief, and that includes respect and concern for the religious communities to which they belong. We're not isolated individuals, but persons in community uh, and those communities, what Edmund Burke called little platoons, are integral to the makeup of our society. And this equal respect and concern, which is asked of us all in our dealings with one another, is a particular obligation on the state in a society which is now as diverse as ours. And this equality isn't just tolerance, it means accepting and celebrating people in their difference, and it's equality understood in an inclusive sense. This equality is, of course, one of the marks of a secular society, but we need to be very careful about the use of that word secular. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, the most reverend and noble Lord Williams of Oystermouth, draws a helpful distinction between programmatic and procedural secularism. The latter is what we must all accept, for it refers to a set of procedures, arrangements and rules of discourse that enable rational debate to take place and decisions to be made with everyone participating on an equal basis. Programmatic secularism, however, has been perceived as an attempt to drive the religious voices out of the public square altogether, and this must be resisted, for the public square is quite rightly a crowded place where all voices need to be heard, including religious ones. As often as not, those religious voices will be translated into the shared assumptions of public reasoning, but this should not be mandatory. Secondly, in the sphere of religion, it's desirable that fellow citizens should try both to understand and make themselves intelligible to their fellow citizens. And this is a particular duty on public officials and educational establishments in a multi-faith society. They must foster and enable this to ha happen. And this may have particular implication for policies such as for the training of imams from uh, abroad, and it certainly has huge implication for education in our society, where there's such widespread religious illiteracy, together with many concerns about what is being taught and no less on how it is being taught. Thirdly, public authorities should beware of privileging only certain forms of authority or religious representation. There are often groups, such as women, who need to be heard and who lack access to power. Public authorities should not replicate and reinforce oppressive practices that might be present in a particular faith community. And fourthly, in a society in which we all have multiple identities, our identity as UK citizens imposes a duty to the state. Whilst both Christians and Muslims, for example, will claim a higher loyalty according to the tenets of the religion, this must not be interpreted as loyalty to a foreign power structure as it was, for example, by some Roman Catholics in the 16th century. And then fifthly, in devising public policy, we need to take into account where we are as a result of our history and culture. There is no neutral realm, and what we have now is quite specific achievement that has been worked out over many centuries. It's a fantasy to think that there's some new, neutral, secular blueprint existing somewhere else which can simply be plonked down. Now, clearly, one feature of where we are now is the existence of an established church. And here, of course, I have to declare an interest as someone who's had the privilege and fulfilment of being a bishop in that church, serving society for my lifetime. Now, many years ago, Professor Owen Chadwick pointed out that the relationship of church and state was a cord with a number of different threads. In recent years, some of those threads have been cut. The church now has freedom to order its own forms of worship and in practice to nominate those it wants as bishops, to take just two examples. And the point is that the relationship of the Church of England to the state has changed, is changing and could change further, could change further in an inclusive direction that reflects our diverse society. Now one of the features of the Church of England I really would want to affirm is the way in recent decades it has taken the lead not only in building up good relationships with other faith communities, 
but in the way it has exercised its historic position in a hospitable way. In the autumn of 2013, I had to preach at the service marking the beginning of the legal year for the Western Division in Bristol Cathedral. A similar service for judges, lawyers, magistrates and civic authorities takes place in every part of the country at that time of the year. In Bristol that year, both the High Sheriff and the Mayor were Muslims, the woman High Sheriff being very devout. She asked that a passage from the Quran be read, including the key opening passage. The Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Bristol, acceded to her request, and it was arranged that the Quran be read in the cathedral when everyone had been seated and welcomed, but before the actual Christian service began. It was, I think, a brilliant, creative uh, act of accommodation that made the Muslim High Sheriff feel, as she said, warmly embraced, but did not alienate the core congregation, or indeed Muslims or Christians, by a blurring of boundaries. And I think this principle of hospitality can and should be reflected uh, in many public ceremonies, including the next coronation service. In a speech on the 15th of February 2012, Her Majesty the Queen said about the Church of England, its role is not to defend Anglicanism to the exclusion of other religions. Instead, the Church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in this country. It certainly provides an identity and spiritual dimension for its own many adherents, but also gently and assuredly, the Church of England has created an environment for other faith communities and indeed people of no faith to live freely. My Lord, that puts so well what the Church of England has tried to do in recent years and what I know it will continue to do in, in, in an increasingly inclusive way, whilst not assuming that it should always take the lead. Lastly, the European Convention on Human Rights is now rightly a benchmark for our society. As we know from recent legal cases, there are occasions when some people feel that this clashes with a fundamental religious uh, belief or right. My own belief, view is that human rights should prevail in areas of dispute, but that the law should be formulated and enforced with what the Equality and Human Rights Commission once termed reasonable accommodation. This seems to be, my laws, in the spirit of the culture of the United Kingdom, as, for example, compared with France. In other words, we accept, so far as possible, expressions of religious difference. There are certain fundamentals, of course, on which there can be no compromise, so that any religious-based view in conflict with them must be overridden by that human right. But on some issues, there ought to be some scope for latitude. My Lords, I said religion is now a major player on the public stage that our parents would have had difficulty in imagining. And religion impinges on a number of key areas in our society, not least the law and education. For that reason, it's vitally important that any government thinks clearly and consistently about its approach. What I've tried to do is to set out a few general principles that I believe should guide policy making. I look forward to hearing what your Lordship have to say and in due course to the response of the government. I beg to move. The question is that this motion be agreed to. My Lords, I congratulate